I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I've always wanted to preach a sermon about Judas, but I've never had a reason to preach one. The occasion has never presented itself. Um, Either the readings have never aligned, or the season was never right for it. There's good reason to give a sermon about Judas during Suicide Prevention Month. There's a good reason to give a sermon about Judas when we're talking about redemption or the omnipotence of Jesus. And I guess because the readings did align today and God has a sense of humor about when inspiration strikes, there's a reason for a sermon about Judas on Mother's Day and a reason for a sermon about Judas on a day we celebrate a baptism. We're in Ascension Tide now. The Ascension was observed on Thursday, and we are in the ten days between the final departure of Christ and the entrance of the Holy Spirit. This is where we find the disciples in the book of Acts today. 120 believers had gathered to hear Peter speak, and Peter chooses to address the truth straight away. The scripture had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. The passage we read this morning leaves out the few verses about what happened to Judas, according to Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts. It's not a lovely end for Judas, who uses the money he made from turning Jesus over to the authorities to buy property and has an accident on that property. And it isn't something that one comes back from, and we'll just leave it there. For Peter to confront this truth to those gathered is a painful thing. It's unsettling for the disciples to accept that one of Jesus' chosen confidants, one of them, had betrayed Jesus in such a way so as to have facilitated his execution. We do not forget, however, that Peter himself had denied Jesus after his arrest, or that the rest of the disciples scattered, abandoning Jesus to his fate. But now, in this post-ascension, pre-Holy Spirit reality, the disciples are having to decide what to do about this Judas problem. Filling Judas's vacated place is the first item of business taken up by Jesus, the, the followers of Jesus after his departure replacing Judas, where they had all had a chance for redemption. Judas was only ever going to be replaced. And there's something really sad to me about that. We know that as Jesus prays in the gospel this morning for the disciples, that Judas's fate has been decided. And it had been decided long before Jesus set out to do his ministry. There was going to be one who would betray the Son of Man. And now was the time for that plan to unfold. Judas had missed the entirety of the farewell discourse, the vine and the branches, the many dwelling places, everything that we have been savoring for the past couple of weeks. Judas had gone out of the place Where we're in chapter 17, Judas had gone out of the place back in chapter 13 during the Last Supper after Jesus tells him to do quickly what he was going to do. How long did Jesus know that Judas would be the one to betray him? Did he know even before Judas was called to be a disciple? If so, 
Jesus called him anyway. Why? Judas is a necessary part of the story. He is a cog in our salvation machine. I mean, we are all necessary parts of this great story of God's creation. But how did God decide which of the twelve would be the one to betray Jesus? Was it decided before they were called or after? Could it have easily just have been, have been Peter or Andrew or James or John? Were lots cast just as they were when Matthias was chosen to take Judas's place? Casting lots today looks a lot like flipping a coin or drawing straws to make an unbiased or uninfluenced decision. The hope is that the decision made is fair. And according to Proverbs chapter 16, the decision is always the Lord's. So the fact that Matthias was chosen was the Lord's will, even if the method looks like chance to the unbelieving eye. So if it was the Lord's will, and everything is the Lord's will, lots are probably out the door in the choosing of Judas as the betrayer of Jesus. Judas would have been created and set on course for the purpose of carrying out this very important part of God's plan for humankind. And I think that Judas would have continued playing his part for as long as he needed to. Jesus was the one who set things in motion, not Judas. As they were eating the Last Supper, Jesus dips his bread into the dish and says, the one to whom I give this piece of bread is the one who will betray me. And it is not until he hands the piece of bread to Judas that Satan enters Judas and he heeds Jesus' words to carry out his work quickly and departs. To the end, Judas follows Jesus' directives. And as Jesus prays for the disciples here in John, Jesus prays even for Judas, the one destined to be lost so that the scripture might be fulfilled. This is and has been the will of the Lord. This has always been the plan, Judas's purpose. It is also the will that Matthias is the one to take the place of Judas among the twelve. This morning, we're going to baptize Easton into the household of God. And that, too, I believe, is the will of God. Easton has been looking for a church home for a long time and has settled here at St. Mark's because he feels peace here. He has friends here. It is not coincidence that God walked him through the doors and sat him down here and then brought him back and then brought him back again and then brought his mom and his sister in with him. Easton, do you feel like this is where God wants you to be? And now Easton is here, ready to make a commitment that most of us have made or have had made on our behalf, and we are going to renew that commitment right alongside him. Easton, there are a few things that you should know before you come up here to be baptized this morning. One, Baptism is not something you enter into alone. Every person in this room comes alongside you and joins you in what is going to happen today. We will all commit ourselves to doing everything in our power to support you in your life in Christ. Because we have all had communities commit themselves to us in the same way. This is the Lord's will that we care for one another. 
Two, you do not start your discipleship without a whole lot of people praying for you. That's a big part of what we will do this morning and how Jesus left his disciples before he went out to be arrested. He did not leave them to their discipleship without a whole lot of prayer. He asks God to protect them, that they may be one. As we are one, he says, speaking to God. United, together in the message and in purpose, to spread the good news and the love of God throughout the world. It's how we're here today. Why we're all sitting here in Casper, Wyoming, worshiping the same God, striving for the same unity. He asks God that they may have the joy of Christ complete in themselves because to know, to know that joy is to know that even when being human is hard and even when this world feels really unkind and unfair, that there is still a force for good working in our favor and that we are called to work in its favor too, to share the love of Christ and radiate joy even when there seems to be none. And the third thing I want you to know before you come up here is that we are all called by God in different ways. Some of us are called to be priests. Thankfully, those are very few and far between. Some of us are called to serve others. Some of us are called to be preachers. Some of us are called to quiet ministries. Some of us are called to lives of prayer. Some of us are called into mission work. And there are a million other ways that God calls us to. And it's up to you and God to learn what that means for you. For many women in this room, they know that they were called to be mothers. And we celebrate them today. Many other women were not called to be mothers, but to be influential women in a variety of other ways, and we celebrate them today, too. We get to spend our discipleship discovering over and over how God calls us because God will relentlessly pursue us our entire lives. Thankfully, only one of us had to betray Jesus into the hands of his executioners. That burden belonged to one person. And while his role is vital to my discipleship and yours, we can be grateful that we do not shoulder his responsibility. We welcome you into the household of God, and we renew our own baptismal covenants that we might become one as God is one, that we might have the joy of Christ complete in ourselves, and that we might more relentlessly Pursue the God who pursues us. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Baptism Day. And happy occasion to preach about Judas Day. <laughs> Amen.